Sulawesi, Indonesia, an ancient island shrouded in mysteries. Creatures live here that are found nowhere else on Earth. And this man has come in search of one of the rarest and strangest of them all. It is a shadowy and elusive predator, the mighty civet. Jack West is normally found far from the forests of Sulawesi. He's a maintenance engineer for a chemical company in Melbourne, Australia. Pipes, pressure and pro-vitamins may fill his world, but he also dreams of tropical forests and remarkable creatures. When Jack was in his 20s, he was curator of the Jakarta Zoo. In 1979, as part of a joint Indonesian and Smithsonian Institute expedition, he went to Sulawesi to trap civets. They caught two. But within three years, both were dead. We know surprisingly little about the Sulawesi palm civet. It was discovered only a hundred years ago and looks like a cat, but is closely related to the mongoose. Scientists named it Macrogalidia. Within 40 years of the civet's discovery, it was widely believed to be extinct. A sighting in 1978 led to the expedition in which Jack took part. Since then, there have been few sightings, and there's fear that numbers are becoming dangerously low. But in Australia, Jack West is determined to go back to Sulawesi and bring the elusive civet out of the shadows. He has family in Melbourne and is part of a large Indonesian community, but he misses the animals and birds of his home. His dream is to create sanctuaries for endangered creatures. But for now, his energy will be diverted toward one animal, the civet. By uh, capturing it and by putting on a film and by studying it even more in the field, then there is a possibility to contribute to uh, conservation education yeah. and which is very important for the conservation of the uh, animal itself and uh, with this it's also to the local people that the world is looking at their locality the world is looking at their area and life and uh, that the world is interested in the richness and in this um, species of animal there the, the more it is known about the animal, the more the better measurement and protection and uh, education can be given to the locals who are still snaring, trapping and uh, hunting animals. But Jack may already be too late. Officially, the civet is listed as a threatened species. Years of habitat loss, as well as hunting and snaring, may have pushed it to the brink. In the forest of Sulawesi, there are many unique and bizarre creatures, like the red-knobbed hornbill and the bear couscous, a marsupial that feeds like a primate. These creatures have been shaped by millions of years of isolation. There are at least five kinds of macaque, all different and all unique to the island. One of the tiniest primates in the world the spectral tarsier. is a mighty hunter. Isolation and time can create variations in the size of animals. The Anoa is a buffalo that's smaller than a domestic cow and found only here, as is the bizarre barbirusa or pig deer. Virtually all of these animals are found in the vast expanse of Lori Lindu National Park. And Jack's first priority is to get a permit to trap for civets in the park. Always looking for more information on the civet, he quizzes the district head, who unfortunately has had little experience with the animal. So, not one to miss an opportunity to educate, Jack shares what he knows with him. In return, he receives his permit and can now head off on the hunt. When Jack finds a civet, he plans to record images on film before releasing it again. 
the elusive creature has never been filmed, and he hopes it will give the people of Sulawesi an appreciation of this amazing animal, and so help educate them. But first, he needs wire mesh to make a civet-proof filming enclosure. Using what he learned in the first expedition, Jack has devised a new baiting method for which he needs small wire cages. He has successfully tested it in Australia and believes that it will give him the speedy capture he needs. That night, Jack pours over old civet studies, searching again for any clue that might give him an edge over an animal that ranges widely, is extremely weary, and may be very low in numbers. Next morning, he's to head up country and meet with a senior park ranger who's been assigned to work with him, a man called Ulisan. there's a misunderstanding and they miss each other. The civet hunt is delayed for a few frustrating hours as they hunt instead for Ulisan. Unfortunately, the hunters have never heard of Ulisan, but they do know of the civet. They used to hunt them, but haven't caught one for years. If these men who spend every day in the forest have no recent knowledge of the civet, then it's going to make Jack's task very difficult and he has only four weeks leave in which to find one. The rangers think Ulisan is back the way Jack came. But when he retraces his footsteps, Jack meets a man who's very certain that he's going entirely the wrong way. But finally, he finds someone who knows both Ulisan and where he is. back at his office near Lori Lindu National Park. There it is. Over the next month, these men will become close companions in their search for the shadow of the forest, the civet. But Ulisan has found something interesting. A few weeks ago, while on patrol in the park, he picked up some palm fruit. Now, if it is a, um, uh, the sort of a civet, then it will put this teeth around there and press it and sort of suck it in and, and eat it like that and, instead of damaging it. Although the civet is a predator, they also have a fondness for fruit, particularly palm fruit. Ulisan found the fruit close by in the Lori Lindu yes, National yes. Park. And he has even more evidence. They were on a patrol. They, they were on a patrol in the forest, uh, Pak Yan, and they, they found the local people wearing this, the Sulawesi civet. You can tell them from the stripes and, and the indication there on the, on the tail. This is, of course, because it is very uh, ill conserved that all the hair and the fur is coming off. But this is 100% evidence that the Sulawesi civet is here. And if it is here, we're going to catch it. The discovery of the hat is both good news and bad, for it shows what can happen to the wildlife in Sulawesi. Confident that he's in the right place, but aware how little time he has, Jack is keen to get started. He'll be staying at Ulisan's house, a short distance from where they'll be setting their traps. Lori Lindu is the largest national park on the island, at 891 square miles. And much of it is mountainous. Though he hasn't had time to find bait, Jack decides to go out anyway. He wants to look over the area, and will put out a couple of traps. The rice fields stretch out towards the park. They're a reminder of the people's need for food, some of which comes from the forest. The river acts as a natural border between the people and the park, 
which Jack thinks may work to his advantage, as the civets will be less wary of people. But little does Jack know, the river is also prone to flood. Jack is under no illusion that his quest for this predator will be easy. They follow well-worn hunter's tracks up into the hills beyond the river. And Ulusan leads Jack towards the area where he found the palm fruit. I think this is the, uh, the, the most perfect um, situation where I have a valley there, I have a gully there, and I have a, a gully down here. Um, quite steep valley. But, uh, I am hoping to, to attract any predator, uh, whichever uh, civet is roaming this area. Uh, I think there will be two separate territories there, uh, in, in that area there and in this area. So I'm hoping to have two um, solitaire civet to come to the trap. And so I have a double chance at this area. These are the same type of trap Jack used to catch the animal on his last expedition. So he knows they work. But on that expedition, it took them over three months to catch only two of them. This time, Jack has only four weeks. He checks that the trigger plate is sensitive and enough to go off with the lightest footfall. They also take special care to make sure the trap is hidden. Past research shows that civets hunt over a wide area and altitude. So with the first trap placed, the team moves higher to look for the next likely spot. And then, a great discovery. Jack finds undeniable evidence that the animal is in the area. Fresh civet droppings, which Jack identifies from the undigested palm fruit seeds. This is, this is 100%, yeah, this is evidence. Uh, as I said before, it, it doesn't really matter where the civet is. With this new technique of the audible and, and noisy um, baits that we are going to put in the trap, uh, I'm confident to attract the, uh, the civet as far as 500 meters, uh, subject to wind, uh, favorable wind and, uh, and, and other noise. But as you, as you hear, this is a wonderful noise, isn't it? This is the, uh, the forest cacophony. And uh, I, I'm sure at night it's even better. The forest is alive. It's a good sign. Plenty of noise means plenty of prey for the civet. Further up the hill, Jack finds what he's been looking for. Ripe palm fruits. This is a perfect place for the second trap. Again, they go through the ritual of covering and testing the trap. Without any real bait, they use a little ripe fruit in case a hungry civet passes this way and might be tempted into the trap. There's 100% evidence uh, of the civet uh, in this area here. There is food in abundance, there is uh, the evidence that, that is there, that there is a shelter, the, the fig trees, there is also um, ripe figs uh, on, upon which the, the birds are feeding and then the birds drop little, uh, the, the little figs, uh, fruits, also on the forest floor. So this area here is uh, almost perfect. On the way back down, Jack picks up some of the droppings, and on closer inspection, the find is even more significant. Oh, it's quite, quite, quite new. It's only tonight. Only tonight. 
There was a civet right here last night. He carries it with him so he can spread a little around the lower cage, hoping to mask some of the human scent. With both traps in place, it's time to leave the forest. It's been a good first day. Jack has good reason to feel confident. Ulisan's house is on the edge of the village of Gimpu, a small rural settlement with a school, shops and churches. Only about a hundred people live here, but many from the surrounding countryside use its services. Increasingly, places such as this are shrinking as residents move to the city, which may be good news for the surrounding wildlife. The next day, the civitas move back into the forest. This time, they have their bait. At last, Jack gets to use his new baiting method. He places two rats in the same small cage, so their noisy squabbling over food will attract any civet over a 500-yard range. Even if a civet enters the trap, the rats are protected within an inner cage and may live to squeal another day. Hopefully it will rain tonight, and when it's raining, then a lot of our smells, all the human smell and so on, they will wash away, and um, the civet will then be uh, more comfortable in, uh, in coming closer. Down in the village, a feast is prepared to celebrate Jack's arrival and the beginning of the civet hunt. Ulisan's family prepare the pork, rice, fresh green bananas and spinach picked from their gardens. A large group of friends, neighbours and relatives gather to eat and celebrate with Jack as the guest of honour. On an island of many religions, most people of central Sulawesi are Christians. And among the invited guests are members of the local Salvation Army Church. Later that night, the rain Jack hoped for arrives. The rain tonight is a little bit too much. I would uh, really appreciate the rain, as I said before, but only a little bit so uh, you can, it, it can wash away all the human traces and so on. By morning, the rain has cleared and Jack sits on the balcony, enjoying the sunshine with his morning cup of coffee. At 12 o'clock, we were still, still outside and uh, the rain stopped, so the civet would have had plenty of time to still look around for food. If civets are still in the area, Jack feels sure his trapping method will draw them in. Perhaps today will reward his confidence. As the hunters walk out for the first trap check, the first work begins on the paddy fields. Rice is the staple crop of this area. It involves and sustains everyone and is part of the life cycle around Gimpu. The river is up after last night's rain. But in their eagerness to get to the traps, the searchers barely notice the water or the climb.
as they approach the first trap. They discover the door is closed. The trap has been sprung, but not by a civet. Jack has caught a serpent eagle. The trap works. Wrong animal. At least the traps and his new baiting method work. Jack handles the eagle with comfort and ease. He's had plenty of practice during his years as zoo curator. It's a wonderful bird and uh, you're going to let it go. But he knows that for this bird to have been caught, the position of the trap isn't ideal. They'll have to move it. Up the hill at the second trap, it's another story. This one hasn't even been sprung. The civet has remained elusive for today. It takes them five hours to check the traps and get back to the village, where there is more work to be done. There will be a constant need for bait, so Jack travels some distance away from the village to trap larger rats. There is also a lot of work to be done converting an old storage shed into the studio in which he hopes to film the captured civet. If there's a gap anywhere, the animal will find it. So Jack needs to make it absolutely civet proof. They line the enclosure completely with wire netting. The civet may spend only a few days here, but Jack is determined it will not escape. When he goes back to check his bait trap, Jack has a rat, but not the sort he was after. Not the forest one, no, I'm expecting a bigger one. Apatikus book. Apatikus. It's now the fourth day without a catch. Jack and Ulusan decide to put out more traps so they can cover a wider area and increase their chances of success. Civets are mostly nocturnal and spend most of their life in the trees. Any branch could harbour a sleeping civet. All their traps are now deployed and carefully set. But another day passes with no sign of the civet. In the valley, the fields have been flooded and it's time to set the rice crop. To ensure the future harvest, they press plants firmly into the flooded field. The work is hard, but the harvest makes it worthwhile. Meanwhile, in the forest, where the work is hard too, things aren't going quite so well. We're going higher, 1,700 meters, possibly. Put the other one, the other trap in. Another day without luck. And at around 5,000 feet, Jack will need luck. It's only five days into the expedition, but it's raining a lot more at night than he'd expected. And he thinks the rain is dampening civet activity and quietening his noisy bait. It seems the quest is going to be much more difficult than he had thought. On his first Sunday, Jack gathers with the local Christians at the Salvation Army Church.
he's been asked to talk to the congregation, and naturally he picks as his theme the search for the civet. Central Sulawesi's Christians would hunt and eat most animals, including the civet, when hungry for meat, unlike followers of the island's other main religions. As the second week begins, a routine is established. Each day, Jack and Ulisan check the traps and feed the bait. Unfortunately, the results are routinely negative. But Jack remains optimistic. So far, we haven't uh, found evidence that the civet have even come close to the traps. So that is a bit discouraging. Uh, but uh, as you know, it's, it's only the uh, today is the seventh day, or actually the sixth day after we have set the trap. Jack believes civets travel alone within an area that may take 10 days to cover. With such a large territory, it means the animal may only pass a trap two or three times during his stay. No luck, another two to go. Uh, we have had some corns here on the well, we, we clean it up. It's, it's not even frequented by, by any animal at all. In the short time he's been in the valley, Jack has been spreading the word about the very special local animals the people share the island with. He'd mentioned a rare long-nosed squirrel, and one afternoon a hunter believes he's caught one in the forest. Unfortunately, it isn't the rare long-nosed species. But it is a good chance for the villagers to see one of their wild animals at close quarters and alive. Jack is rapidly becoming the village's Dr. Doolittle. But he's more pressing concerns. The first 10 days are over with not even a sign of a civet. To minimize disturbance, they're now checking the traps only every second day. But with nothing to show for their work, Jack and Ulisan are forced to reassess their strategies. So there are three factors. First is the, uh, <coughs> the, the traps that we have. They, they need to be uh, blended in into the area, according to Ulisan. Secondly, the civets are not many around. M not many of them are around here, uh, around in the area. They have a very small uh, distribution. And, and the third one is that it's, very, uh, it's, it's a cunning animal. It's, it's, it's a real uh, shrewd, a real uh, clever animal, so to say, uh, to catch. <laughs> 